I'm Sarah Lynch. I am the region of the National the Manhattan Chapter, National Society Daughters of the American Revolution. And I actually brought a note card because uh, I had forget long names I had to write it down, and it just happened to be on the back of the trace envelope. So Susan Seal is here. Can can Scott, can I bring Susan out? Can she stand over here? Okay. Um, so this is Susan Seal. Susan is a very impressive person. And she is the founder and president of, and this is what I had to write down, Renzo Dell House Rashambo headquarters. And that's where we get involvement of audience involvement. We're going to say it together, okay? Everybody, I'll say it first. Friends of Odell House, Rochambeau, Rochambeau, see, see, thank you, Rochambeau headquarters. Everybody, Friends of Odell House, Rochambeau headquarters. Okay, thank you. Susan is a graduate, undergraduate of Brown University. She has a master's degree in urban and regional planning and her emphasis is on historical, I'm sorry, historical preservation. Uh, Susan, Susan, um, sorry, Susan um, was the uh, chair of the uh, Westchester County Historical Society. And what I was going to say is among her accolades, what she's really impressive for is her love and passion of preserving the Odell House. The Odell House is a um, 18, it was built in 1732. It is a quintessential uh, historical 18th century farmhouse that is intact with its details, which makes it so impressive. And big and it was the headquarters of the Comte de Rochambeau. Okay. And with that, I present Susan Seal. Thank you for being here, Thank Susan. You. It's a pretty <laughs> Okay. Welcome everyone to the story of Odell House. I'll forget about the Rochambeau headquarters for now um, in Hartsdale, just 20 miles away. I thank you for the opportunity to speak in this historic building to a distinguished group like yours. All of us are working to educate the public about the role played by New York in the American Revolution and Odell House is a major part of that story. Let me begin by telling you about Odell House and how it fits into this narrative and why it is so important. From a purely architectural point of view, at close to 300 years old, Odell House represents one of the only surviving examples of Dutch timber frame houses remaining in Westchester County. It is one of only two tenant farmhouses remaining from the era of the Phillipsburg Manor, and the only one that has survived in an unrestored state. It has been only slightly modernized, and each section remains unrestored almost in completely as the year of their construction. The house has never had central heating, central plumbing, and much of the original woodwork remains. In the 1730s, Greenberg was part of Frederick Phillips Patton, the manor of Phillipsburg. That consisted of 90,000 acres extending from the Bronx line all the way to the Croton River. The first Frederick had come to New Amsterdam as a Dutch immigrant carpenter in 1653. He managed to remain to maintain excellent relations with the British after New Amsterdam became New York, and a fortuitous marriage to a wealthy widow helped him accumulate what eventually totaled 81 square miles. What would that be worth today? In 1732. See the whole screen. Oops. There we go. That's, that's better. Except we went a little too far. Okay. Uh, in 1732, John Tompkins leased 296 acres in the manor. Tompkins was a descendant of a founder of the English settlement known as the Eastchester Colony that was chartered in 1664. 
By the early 1700s, that colony had grown and its members spread throughout Westchester. John built a two-room Dutch timber frame cottage in 1732, and he lived in it, according to early records, until he went to Eastchester to return for church services in this little church. This is actually a rendering of the church from the 1730s in Eastchester. The legend goes that at that time, he was surrounded by peaceful natives, most likely the Wequasequeeps, who were part of the Algonquins. That first little cottage is the central section of Odell House, seen outlined in red in this photograph. Tompkins Farm thrived, and by 1740, he leased more land and built a larger house to accommodate his family on another lot. In 1760, his son sold the original cottage to Gilbert Bates and his wife, Sarah. The Bates also assumed the land lease with Phillips and added a second identical building to the east end of the cottage. In this picture, it's the section outlined in red, but without the second floor shown here. In the 1760s, a tenant's life was good in the manor. The Bates sat, farm sat on a high point in the county with ample water supply and fertile land. They grew wheat and corn, had it milled in the manor's mills, and shipped it to markets from ports. Whoops, where do we have that happen? From ports along the Hudson. This is a rendering of what the mills at Phillips Manor Hall would have looked like. But in the wider world, the turbulence of the French and Indian War and the growing indignation of the colonists from British rule began. All of you know the history of those years, so I'll move ahead to 1776. By this time, when George Washington had to retreat from Manhattan and move his battered army to Peekskill, Westchester became known as the neutral ground. The British were in control of the territory up to Kingsbridge in the Bronx, and the Continentals held strength in the northern part of the county, but the land in between was deemed neutral. In fact, it was more of a desperate, scorched earth, with a mostly apolitical population who resisted taking sides. Most of the tenant farmers and small landowners just wanted to live and farm as they had done for decades. Typical New Yorkers, they were more concerned with economic stability than political turmoil. However, they lived between two large occupying armies who were desperate to provide food for their troops. This is from James Fenimore Cooper's The Spy, and it shows, I don't know if it's loyalists or patriots coming to take whatever the poor tenant farmer has left in his house. Their towns were burned. And then repeatedly, the victims of foraging and raiding parties from bands of British and their loyalist allies, known as cowboys, and rogue patriots, known as skinners. This is an image of James DeLancey, the loyalist sheriff of the South Bronx. You can see the cattle behind him that he is driving south to the British, having confiscated it from a Westchester farm. Hence the name Cowboys. Now let's move on to the most important event that occurred at Odell House, the Phillipsburg encampment and the French-American alliance. From the beginning of the war, the founding fathers knew they needed the support of other nations. As early as March, 1776, Benjamin Franklin was in Paris negotiating with Louis XVI and his court. Many French nobles were enamored of the ideals from the Enlightenment that they saw embodied by the Patriot cause. With the signing of the Declaration of Independence, Louis XVI felt he was no longer dealing with the rebellious subjects of another king, but with an independent nation. France approved the sum of over a million gold livres to buy arms and ammunition to send to the Continental Army. In Trumbull's painting of the victory of Saratoga in 1777, it now hangs in the rotunda of the US Capitol, the cannon and the arms are French. By February of 1778, 
a treaty was signed between France and the United States to give more aid to the new nation. But the years of 1778 and 1779 saw too many British victories. Washington was defeated in Pennsylvania, the British occupied Philadelphia, and things looked bleak for the patriots. But Lafayette went back to France to plead the cause of the revolution. Everyone knew that more than arms were needed. George Washington wrote to his friend, John Lawrence, I am at the end of my tether. Now or never, deliverance must come. Finally, at the beginning of 1780, the king agreed to send troops and he elevated the Comte de Rochambeau to the rank of Lieutenant General to lead the forces. On May 5th, 1780, Rochambeau sailed from Brest with 7,000 sailors, 5,300 troops, and 450 officers. They arrived in Newport on July 11th, 1780. Once the French arrived, Washington and Rochambeau began a series of meetings to plan their campaign to defeat the British. It was too late in the year to begin that campaign in 1780, but their final plan was to have the French march south to join the Continental troops in Greenberg. Washington would set up his camp in today's Ardsley and Rochambeau would headquarter in today's Parsdale. Once there, Washington wanted to plan a campaign to drive out the British and regain Manhattan Island. He had always felt that that would mean the defeat of the British. Getting the French troops south meant moving over 5,000 men, at least 100 horses and another 100 oxen over unmapped territory with limited or no roads. General Rochambeau sent his quartermaster, the Comte de Beville, ahead to map out an itinerary from Newport. The itineraries, oh, John O'Dell may in fact have been one of de Beville's guys. The itineraries that de Beville wrote have been saved in the journals of his aide, Berthier, and they read like 18th century GPS. You cross a hollow and a brook and then a plain. You come to a place where the road divides in three directions. The right hand road goes over the Bronx River and up a hill and leads to the camp. You go up onto a height, you turn left, come to a ford, and that is General Rochambeau's headquarters. These directions cover the entire march from Newport to Virginia. The route the French followed is now part of the Washington Rochambeau Revolutionary Route, a National Park Service trail. So the route you're looking at here is Newport, and they came from Newport down here to Westchester. Their final march was the destination down to Yorktown in October. Once the maps were joined for the march and the supplies gathered, the huge port force left Newport on June 26, 1781. They covered the 220 miles from Newport to Hartsdale in 11 days. This march has been described as the largest military movement ever achieved before the European theater of operations in World War II. Think of the logistics, think of the supplies. Rochambeau had to hire 344 local wagon drivers to haul all the provisions on the march. The oxen hauling the wagons did not speak French. <laughs> the oxen and horses alone needed 136 wagons of fodder every week. Almost 400 men collapsed from the heat. Remember, they are wearing heavy wool uniforms. And I might add, mostly they were white. And where did they arrive? After those long days of marching, fording streams and climbing hills, 
the troops arrived in Hartsdale on July 6, 1781 at Odell House. If you can follow this heavy blue line, they came down here from Connecticut, they stopped in Armonk, then they came down to Phillipsburg and they stayed. This is the area that we are talking about right now. After those long days of marching, fording streams and climbing hills, the troops arrived in Hartsdale. Despite the depredations of the neutral ground years, our Odell house was still standing. From the limited data available, we have been able to surmise that Gilbert Bates was probably a loyalist. There are fables of him being tied backwards to a horse and driven out of town. And he is listed in the 1778 census as keeping shop in Manhattan. By 1781, his wife, Sarah, was described as the widow base, and she was living with relatives in Eastchester. She offered her vacant house to General Washington, and he gave it to Rochambeau. The four-room house only had space for the general and a few aides, but there were barns and outbuildings, and the other officers found quarters in the neighboring houses. The troops spread out. You can see here, outlined in red, this is George Washington's headquarters. Here is Rochambeau. And if you can see, this is the Bronx River, spelled then Bronx, and over here, the sawmill. And if you were to continue to the west, there would be the Hudson River. The French troops were spread out in this basic area between the Bronx River and the Spring Brook, which is this little line right there, to the, to the west. The main French forces, here's the Hudson River, you can see Rochambeau and Washington's houses were right here. <clears throat> the main France, French forces were camped around the house on current day Hartsbrook Park on Sunnydale Golf Club, where this sign is, and on our front yard. At the same time, the Continental troops numbering about 4,000 were camped on the western flank of the French. They stretched from the Spring Brook almost to the Hudson River. Washington made his headquarters at the Appleby Farmhouse, about a mile away from Rochambeau, but sadly now lost. The famous tent that traveled with Washington throughout the war and is now the centerpiece of the Museum of the American Revolution was pitched right here. We will be holding a large event this coming September 30th in Hartsdale, and the Museum of the American Revolution is bringing their replica of the tents as part of that event. So put it on your calendar. After the troops had settled into their camps and the generals had made the plan, their plans, Washington and Rochambeau conducted three days of reconnaissance miss missions in July to determine the possibilities of defeating the British troops in Manhattan. Now we're in the southern part of this march. So here we are again, Odell is up here, Valentine's Hill is current day Yonkers, and they would take their troops down here through the Bronx to Morrisania. The French and the Americans marched side by side and they were reconnoitering to see how many forces the British actually had. But they discovered that not only did the troop, the British have more troops, they had a huge Navy also controlled the rivers. But the French Navy under the command of Admiral de Grasse had a large fleet of 24 ships presently in the Caribbean where they had survived deadly hurricanes. Correspondence between de Grasse, Washington and Rochambeau had gone back and forth throughout 1781 and Washington had put his hopes on the possible arrival of the French Navy to New York Harbor. Rochambeau had grave doubts about this possibility and about the wisdom of attacking Manhattan. But he followed his orders to serve as second in command to Washington. He could only offer advice and not make the decisions. The decisive moment came on August 14th, on that day, a letter arrived at Odell House from de Grasse, 
saying he could not risk bringing his fleet into New York Harbor. He would sail the fleet as far north as the Chesapeake Bay in Virginia, but no farther. I want you to know that that room depicted in this painting exists almost exactly in this state today. If Washington and Rochambeau could meet de Grasse in Virginia, he would be able to help in their attack on the British. Washington gave up his plan to retake Manhattan and with Rochambeau made the momentous decision not to attack the British in Manhattan, but to move all their forces quietly south to Virginia. This meeting and its decision have been compared in importance to the meetings between Roosevelt, Churchill, and de Gaulle at Casablanca in 1943, a decision by the representatives of sovereign nations planning the defeat of a common enemy. By August 18th, a massive troop movement began. Washington and Rochambeau did not want to alert the British that their plans had changed. So they moved their troops under cover of darkness to the narrowest part of the Hudson River known as King's Crossing. It is now River Plank. We always hear about Washington crossing the Delaware, but this crossing involved thousands of men, animals, and arms, and the British never caught on. It took six long nights, but both armies arrived in New Jersey and began to move south. We all know the march to Yorktown was successful. Here's a redoubt, possibly being led by Hamilton or Lafayette, we're not sure. <laughs> um, and it marks the beginning of the victory of the American Revolution. And here we have the famous painting of the Battle of Yorktown, where uh, Cornwallis didn't actually surrender. He sent one of his subordinates out because he was too embarrassed to surrender. By 1783, peace had finally come to Westchester. In Hartsdale, the cottage stood empty. Our John O'Dell, this is the only depiction I can find of what a guide might have looked like, uh, had, uh, he had served in the brand reconnaissance and, and other uh, capacities during the war. Um, he showed the Rochambeau and Washington the routes through the Bronx to spy on the British. After the war ended, he married his sweetheart, Hannah McChain, and he bought the cottage and all the improvements from Sarah Bates. He also bought 185 acres of land formerly owned by Frederick Phillips from the commissioners of forfeiture for 700 pounds. You can see now his name is over here on the map. John Tompkins remains next to him with a great deal of land. Almost immediately after buying the cottage, John and Hannah added a second floor to the 1760 portion of the house. They settled down. John was now known as the hero of Greenberg. Hannah had only one surviving child, Nancy, and sadly died in childbirth in 1787. John's second marriage was to Abigail Brown, and they had one son, Here's, here's uh, the only depiction we have of poor Colonel John, his tombstone. Um, they had one son, John Jackson. Jackson stayed on the farm, as did his children and grandchildren. Every generation of the family continued to serve the country, starting with Jackson, who served in the War of 1812, then his grandson, Dykeman, who served in the Lincoln Cavalry in the Civil War, Dykeman had seven children, and he built the final section of the house, the stone section you see here, in 1855. Dykeman's son, Otis, served in the Spanish-American War, and his daughter, Edna, went to France as a nurse with the Red Cross in World War I. By 1965, only one direct descendant of John O'Dell remained, his great-granddaughter, Elizabeth a school teacher. 
Elizabeth dearly wanted to preserve the history of the house that her family had owned for 180 years. And in 1965, she deeded the house to a small chapter of the Sons of the American Revolution for $1. This chapter of the Sons had many plans to restore the house and to open it as a museum as the deed had required, but sadly, they never came to fruition. By 2007, the house looked like this. The 21st century saw rapid deterioration. A tree fell through the roof and massive rain damage occurred to both the floors and the contents still in the house. There was no security around the house and vandals were free to loot its contents and disfigure its walls. Two metal storage containers were parked on the property sometime within the last 15 years. The house was in danger of collapsing or being lost in a fire or a storm. Here are some pictures taken of the house in that era. That is me on my first trip into the attic, looking at trunks that had not been opened for 200 years. This is the Rochambeau room you saw in that painting where Washington and Rochambeau were meeting. Fireplace is still in existence, just needs a little help. This is the second floor, the part that would have been built by John O'Dell, uh, filled with antiques that were just covered with old sheets and the ceiling was collapsing. This is the first floor of the 1855 section. You can see how the water damage came and the ceiling was collapsing and all of the furniture underneath it was badly damaged with water. Again, another shot of the attic. You'll see leather saddles up on top of those trunks. One of two of them are actually side saddles, supposedly one owned by Lady Van Cortland in 1800. We don't know if it's salvageable. And this is the second floor of 1855. A tree had fallen through the roof and nothing had been done to protect it. That light you see at the top of this photograph is not, a, is not an electric light. It is a hole in the roof. The town, so how did I become an advocate for Odell House? In 1998, my husband David here in the front row and I moved to Rochambeau Drive about three blocks away. We were puzzled about the origin of the street name, but some quick research explained the story of the French Alliance, its significance in American history and the fact that it happened right in our neighborhood. I soon realized the significance of that abandoned wreck around the corner from us and began a campaign to save the house and open it as a museum. After years of advocacy and a term as president of the Westchester County Historical Society, my efforts received support from the town of Greenberg supervisor, Paul Finer. He joined me in realizing the importance of the site in American history and also the urgency to save it from collapse. The town brought this giant crane and covered the roof with a tarp. It took months of negotiation with the SAR, but on March 4th, 2020, title passed from the SAR to the town of Greenberg. The friends continued to work with the town to prevent more vandalism, to install a security fence and to save the contents. The town received the first grant from the New York State Department of Parks, Recreation and Historic Preservation, a matching grant totaling 1.2 million. Plans were joined to stabilize the structure and to prevent its collapse. While that was happening, the friends mobilized to empty the house. As you just saw, every room in the house was filled with furniture, piled randomly on top of each other, and much of it destroyed by water damage. There are two board members here with me today, my husband, David, and Vanessa Pasqua. We, with other board members, we spent hours in that cold house, masked because it was COVID and it was dusty, and gloved, packing dozens of crates of pottery, horseshoes, plow heads, broken dishes, and linens. 
Here we are in the house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Odells threw nothing out. They were the original hoarders. <clears throat> And we didn't want to make hasty decisions. The perfect example of this was a length of cloth that the men thought was an old drop cloth. Vanessa and I decided we should look further. And as we held it up, it was clear that there was something in it. We feared a dead cat. There had been several found already. But no, out fell this beautiful carpet bag from the Civil War era. There were dozens of books, mostly destroyed by the water damage, but we did rescue the most important pages from the family Bibles. I could go on and on with treasure discovery stories, but suffice it to say that we now have two rooms filled to the top in a storage facility. The friends have paid rent on those units since 2002. The town completed the supporting of the building in 2021. You see here, this is all interior supports now. This was done just temporarily to prevent the walls from collapsing and the ceilings from falling down. They also covered the windows with special coverings that have vents in them that allow air circulation to continue. The plans for the new roof were finished were approved and the roof will be finished by the end of this month. It's hard to tell, but these two sections that are visible here are all new. This section is just, is all done waiting for some special piece of mahogany that has to go across the top. I don't understand that, but they're waiting for that. And as soon as it comes, that will, that will be a new roof also. Remember the second floor photo with all the holes in the roof and the piles of furniture? This is what it looks like now. And the first floor has a new ceiling and a new floor and the French doors are ready to be restored with a grant given to me by the DAR. <laughs> Last year, the town received more grants from the state for a total of $2 million. This will allow all the physical restoration of the building to be completed and to build an ADA accessible entrance and visitor center. With the help of more grants and increased donations from our supporters, the Friends commissioned a cultural landscape report that will be completed at the end of this month, and we hope to start executing it this summer. We published two research reports, one on the story of Edna O'Dell's time in France, and that is on our website. And another one just in December about the enslaved people who lived on the O'Dell farm from 1800 to 1820. We've created several videos, one thanking the French for their support, and another one for use in schools telling the story of uh, the 1781 French alliance to the school children. This is the opening slide from one of those videos. That video is accompanied by a mini museum that Vanessa and I created that has now visited several schools and libraries. It was on, it will be on display again for our big event on May 20th, Follow the French. Um, and it is available on request to go to other locations. Greenberg schools are partnering with us to involve all their teachers and students, and we expect to have an intern program by next year. You can learn more about our projects and the progress we are making on our website, our Facebook pages. This is our website. This is our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. As of next week, we will also be part of a wonderful new technology, the mobile audio tour app known as Travel Stories. The work to re restore Odell House Rochambeau headquarters has received the support of Westchester County officials, of State Senate Minor Majority Leader Andrew Stewart Cousins, and of other members of our state delegations. This year, we hope to extend that support to the federal level. We can now tell you the exciting news 
that the museum will be open by the fall of 2025 in time to celebrate Rochambeau's 300th birthday. We plan to have a grand reopening then, but in the meantime, please mark your calendars for May 20th and September 30th. Come and join us, visit our site, help us create this museum, a site to learn about the wonderful alliance between France and America that won the revolution. Thank you. So much. Uh, does anybody have any questions uh, either here on site or uh, online virtually? Uh, the camera's not working. Uh, no, it's also okay. uh, it's, it's just nothing. Okay. All right. Let's leave them up. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Any questions? I'm um, looking online here. Okay. okay. I have a question yeah. here. How do you, um, uh, how do you go about? Keeping the house as, as it was as much as possible, and considering the damage that was done and the renovation work required, how do you uh, how do you balance the two? Yeah. That's why you need a really good historic preservation architect. <laughs> um, there, I've learned so much since I began this process. I, I thought I would save the house. I didn't go to the next step. What does that mean? How do you create a museum in an 18th century structure? I mean, many, I know that during the bicentennial in the 1970s, there were many, many house museums created in the United States, and you've probably visited them. And you walk in, and it's an old room, and it's got a bunch of glass displays, and maybe a mannequin in the corner with an old piece of clothing on. That's not today's world. Children in the 21st century are going to walk right through that room and they're out. So you have to balance restoring the structure, making sure it is physically stable to support visitors with putting a lot of infrastructure in for audiovisual displays, for interactive displays. Um, the newest museum to open in Westchester is Phillips Manor Hall, which is owned by New York State. They have almost no furniture in it. It is all interactive audiovisual displays. They actually have portraits of people that come alive when you touch it, sort of like Harry Potter, and they talk to you and they answer questions. So the balance is going to be we have all this furniture. <laughs> so some of it will get used. Uh, some of it will get deaccessioned, which is a word I never knew until recently. Um, and we will, uh, with the help of, we have wonderful consultants. We have a museum planning consultant firm called Frank and Glory working with us now, and they are helping us plan the, the bones of creating a museum, a charter, a collection management policy, a memorandum of understanding between the friends and the town. This all began because David and I have really good relationship with the town. And they were like, oh yeah, do this. And it's it's dependent upon that goodwill, but you can't sustain that. You have to have a legal document that says, you're gonna cut the grass and you're gonna run the events. <laughs> so it's a long process. But outside of the structure, you have the elements that were found inside. Right. Will that be put on display? Some of it. Okay. Some of it. One, the next step, the next big step is going to be an inventory of everything we have. Once that inventory is done, which we're hoping to get a grant for, because um, it will take several weeks, then there will be a decision made about what part of it gets saved and what part is actually going to tell all the stories. Vanessa can tell you, David can tell you, we literally have crates of used horseshoes. They never threw anything. So if a horse needed a new shoe, they kept them. If the dish broke, they kept all the pieces. So we cleaning it out didn't want to take the responsibility of saying, oh, dumpster. 
So you have to go through a whole inventory process and decide, oh, that's a whole plate. We'll keep that one. So Scott, is it that strong one? Uh, sure, any, anything? Uh, uh, yes. Have the contents of the 200 year old trunks been opened? Some of them. No, not catalogs. No. They haven't been appraised in technical no. sense. No, we, you know, I mean, some of us are a bit familiar with antiques and the very beginning, I was very lucky to have the assistance of a wonderful man named Bill Ketchum, who was one of the foremost authorities on early American antiques, particularly stoneware pottery, because I found beautiful pieces of stoneware all over the house, on the floors on top of cabinets, and some of those trunks are still filled with stoneware. Um, and he helped me get some idea of what they were. And then we ended up literally bringing them back to our house, washing them in our laundry room sink and repacking them safely. And they're in those cartons up at the storage center. I saw a question back then. Was there much of 18th century furniture in the house? There is 18th century furniture stored in two shipping containers that are illegally parked on the site. We are working to get full access to that furniture. Because, because that furniture was very valuable. Some of it is. Okay, it's a vernacular, just local craft people. I mean, you know, we know that there are at least two Chippendale desks and possibly one of them was in the house and Rochambeau may have used it, which would make it much more valuable. Um, but we haven't had full access to that. Second question, were the Odell's originally a Puritan family? No, the Odell's were Dutch and English. Uh, one of the pronunciations of the name is Odell. Uh, John Odell's mother was Margaret Dykeman. So she was Dutch. And we think his first language was Dutch because he grew up uh, on the along the river and he was part of the Sleepy Hollow Dutch uh, congregation. Uh, but Jonathan Odell, who was his father, that family came, we're pretty sure, from England, landed on the coast of Westchester near Rye. And there are thousands of Odells in the United States. I am always getting emails saying, I think I'm a descendant. Um, and I, think, I think that might be my great great grandfather's house. So, yes, Joe. Wonderful presentation. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much. It just thought it occurred to me that it might be fun to reach out to the cultural services department of the French Embassy on Fifth Avenue and say, hey, do you guys want to come up here? And so, Jeremy Robert, who is the Consul General, <laughs> actually gave a dinner for us last May, a fundraiser, which is how I met Sarah. She was at the dinner. Um, the Fifth generation descendant of General Rochambeau, Natalie de Guberville, and her husband came to the United States in May. We were able to take them through the house. Um, and then they were honored at the dinner at the consulate. Um, and it was also a fundraiser for us. So they are very involved. There's another wonderful organization called the Souvenir Francais which is an international organization to honor the sites where any French soldier may have died anywhere not on French soil. And there's a large chapter here in the United States run by a man named Thierry Chanot, and he has been a wonderful supporter of, her, of ours. And he has actually given us funds to put a small monument because we are almost 100% sure that four French soldiers died while they were stationed in Harsdale. They didn't die of combat. They probably died of diphtheria or cholera or the heat. We don't know, but there will be a, a monument to them on the grounds. A couple of questions online. Uh, first one's an easy one. What is the address of the Odell? Oh, there you go. <laughs> 425 Bridge Road, Harsdale, New York. Now, it is not open to the public now. It's not safe. But as I mentioned, we're having this big event on May 20th called Follow the French. And it will be a tour of three sites in Westchester where the French were camped in 1781. 
They came from Connecticut. Their first encampment was in the Bedford, Mount Kisco area. Um, there's a beautiful museum there called Smith's Tavern that is open to the public. And that's the first part of the tour. Then people can come down to us and we're gonna have a tent and a lot of events, very family friendly, friendly meant for children, everybody. And then the final stop on the tour is in Yorktown, which is where the troops stayed for a few days until they could go across the river. I have a question about very invested the support that you received over the years. And we just wanted to find out like how challenging was it for you to get grants? It was a, another learning process. <laughs> I've never written a grant application before. I, I will say that the town have been a wonderful partner in this. Um, they have a, a gentleman who is the commissioner of planning and economic development named Garrett Duquesne, who excels in writing government grant applications. They're 250 pages long. Yeah, so that first grant of the town put up 600,000 and the state matched it with 600,000 really got us going. And then we got a second one that just this past December, which the first grant is covering what we've done, the roof, the stabilization. And then in July, they will start redoing the whole exterior and the windows. The second grant, the second million dollars will be how do you design a museum and how do you put exhibits and creating the rooms. The third million uh, is going to be for the handicap accessible entrances and a wonderful visitor center. I got grants that nonprofit grants tend to be a lot smaller than a million. <laughs> I was lucky that I had a private individual who funded us for two years in a row for $25,000 each, which, you know, paid for our set up costs and, you know, helping us pay for the storage and the Scarsdale Historical Society has also funded us, you know, we're neighbors, so they, they helped us. Oh, another one. Is there a website yeah. that you have or an address we could uh, Odell Rochambeau.org. Odell Rochambeau.org. Okay, thank you very much. If you just search for Odell, you get what's his name? Odell. <laughs> He's an athlete. Oh, Odell Beck. Odell Beck. Odell Beck. You gotta you gotta go Odell Rochambeau.org. And we also have a Facebook page. We also take donations through our website in case anybody would like to support us. We're always looking for more volunteers. Uh, we have a, I have a wonderful board of 15 very knowledgeable, helpful people and some fabulous volunteers, one of them is with us today. Um, it's, it's just been a great group to work with. I, my husband and I retired and now we have this another entire career. So it's 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 just been terrific. There is a great movie about five minutes on, on the website, which in literally six minutes tells you the whole story of how we got together and the intricacies of the fact that we should be much back on your film. Right. I don't know about uh, the maybe it's available to uh the school and everything. Yeah. I mean, none of us, you know, <laughs> the requirements of, of studying U.S. history now yeah. in the fourth grade, the seventh grade, and the eleventh grade. I don't even know if they talk about the French Alliance. You know, I don't think many people know. Uh, we didn't know, you know, why is the street named for a French guy? That was all we knew. We didn't, we, and, and, you know, we're, fairly history oriented, obviously. So I think get the word out. How oh, much land there. does it sit on? I'm sorry. How much land does it sit on again? It, right. It, it only has about 0.9 of an acre, not quite an acre. And is most of it overgrown now or of that that land? Yeah. No, the town has pretty much cleared it out. There were, you know, a lot of invasive species and that's our landscaper is really working on you know, this cultural landscape report 
then we'll make decisions of, do you have an exhibit that rebuilds the ice house? We have the foundation of the ice house. Mm. Uh, we have an area where we know there was a corn crib. Uh, so you have to make decisions about, do you reconstruct and make that you know, part of the tour or do you make it a beautiful native garden? One of the things we know, and this is a work in progress, the 19th century Odell's were major farmers. In 1850, they produced 2000 pounds of butter. The railroad came to Hartsdale in 1843. So they became big suppliers for the New York City market. They were dairy farmers shipping their, their milk and their butter, obviously. And then they switched from that to being, they grew, they had peach orchards and uh, apples and a lot of cider barrels in the house. There's an old cider press. Um, we found a recipe for free peach cordial, and it's from the 18th century, and it's this wonderful script. And it's take a bushel of peaches, take a pound of sugar and a lot of brandy, put it in a crop, and leave it for three months. <laughs> and then you're done. <laughs> so, you know, take one, we're gonna take one more. One more, yeah. Is there any possibility that you could buy an adjacent piece of land uh, and add that to uh, the Odell House? Maybe make the it's a fully it's a fully developed residential neighborhood. There, when the Sons of the American Revolution, the New York chapter of the Sons of the American Revolution, took the property, um, there was a separate acre that was left for um, the the children, the last the last generation. They sold that and a house was built on it in the 80s. I have a very wealthy donor who wants to buy that house and he's going to tear it down and give it to us. Now, right now, the people who live in it don't want to sell it, but you know, we might end up with another acre. We'll see. All right. So you want to close yeah. that? Really important and perplexing question. The acronym is O-H-R-H. -H. Yes. What happened to the F? Oh, <laughs> well, we just refer to it as Odell House Rochambeau Headquarters, which is a big enough <laughs> mouthful. I mean, David and I were in Florida in 2019 having cocktails with another couple who became board members. And we started talking about, well, we think we'll form a nonprofit. What are we going to call it? It was literally the back of a cocktail napkin. Mm -hmm. And we, but the legal national register name is Odell House Rochambeau headquarters. So we had to put all of it. So if you put friends in front of it, <laughs> it makes it kind of long. So just remember Odell Rochambeau. If you go to our website, if you go on YouTube and Facebook, you have to put in friends. So, yeah. but I think you'll all remember us, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you all. Thank you everybody online. If we didn't get a chance to uh, get to your question, please send it and we'll be able to follow up as best we can. Thank you so much. And I'd just like to thank uh, Scott Dwyer, whose uh, title I also had to write down, uh, Executive Director, Sons of the Revolution of the State of New York and its Francis, Francis Tavern Museum. That is Scott's title. <laughs> this whole thing could not have happened without the efforts and the uh, ingenuity of Scott and his team. And so we are grateful. As you know, Susan gave an incredible uh, report of what's going on at the Odell Rochambeau house. And um, being in the DAR, I think everybody in the DAR, probably everybody here, could just listen to you go on and on. <laughs> about all, all the weavings and all of the, uh, all of the connections, it's just fascinating. So we are so privileged and so proud to have you here today. And again, Scott, you and your team, thank you so much on behalf of the Manhattan chapter 
daughters of the American Revolution. And thank you, audience. You have been excellent. We're so glad all of you are here and you said the name Rochambeau House Odell. I'm sorry. Odell yeah. House Rochambeau Headquarters. You have to said a much better lie. Thank you. Have a great opportunity. Thank <laughs> you.